want to leave this place where we grew up This old town, just put it all behind Remember you and I would always find somewhere to hide When we were kids so we could see and hear the water run The river's gonna cry when you're gone Nice to see you again. I'm joined by Oreo today. He stole my chair, so I'm on the floor. <laughs> oh, he's leaving! I'm cozy down here, so I'll sit down here anyway. Today's episode is going to be, warning up front, knitting free, spinning free. Um, <laughs> I haven't gotten a lot done that I can show you. I have, okay, so um, like many of you, when summer was on the horizon, I planned all these things that I could get done and overloaded my plate with way too many things and didn't get enough time to spend with my kids, did way too much, um, and now I'm trying to kind of play catch up with all the things that were on my list that didn't get finished now that the kids are back at school. Though there's one thing that we really wanted to do um, this summer that we didn't get to do, which is go rafting. Neither of the kids have ever been rafting down a river with whitewater rapids and stuff, so we're going to do that this Saturday because it looks like it's going to be warm this Saturday and it might be our last big hurrah of the summer. But I've totally felt like a rabbit this summer with a speeding heartbeat bouncing around from one project to another trying to get everything done. Um, so these past three weeks I've spent working on a lot of class prep stuff for all the classes I'm teaching this fall and finishing up the big beautiful shawl that's going to be going to Making Stories magazine for next fall, their fall issue in 2020. So that is done. I may be able to pick up knitting in a little while, though I might need a good spinning break or something. Anyway, I don't have anything to show you. But I do have lots of things to tell you about from the last few weeks. Random weirdnesses and garden and turtle updates and stuff like that. So hopefully you guys will enjoy a bit of that. Grab yourself some tea, light yourself a candle, have a little downtime. Because if you've been running around like a rabbit like I ha have, you probably need a moment to breathe. <sighs> there we go. Okay. Now. What do I want to tell you about? Um, okay, well the first thing in front of me are these. For those of you who have never seen a hazelnut other than in your Nutella, we have two hazelnut trees on our property. So let me show you what they look like when they come off the tree. So this is what hangs off of the tree. It's a little husk and the nut inside. And then this will come out and there's your hazelnut. So the skin is taken off of it. You can eat it raw or you can roast them and that's how they're usually in Nutella. They're roasted and then added with chocolate and sugar. They might be just one little husk or it might be something more like this where you have three or four attached and they have been falling all over the ground recently, so we've been picking them all up and have a countertop full of Nutella potential. <laughs> so that's a lot of fun. We have a few other nut trees on the property. We have the wild-growing um, black walnuts, which I use a lot with natural dyeing, but I don't like the flavor of the black walnuts as much. They're a lot more bitter. They're not as sweet as English walnuts, so I don't eat them much. But I have a few Engle English walnuts growing that are still very small. It takes years for most nut trees to get to a good productive stage. But then you have, you know, nuts for years to come, which is really nice. It's a good crop to have on your property. So I know that a lot of the nuts that I have planted, I might not see in a good harvest um, for years, but they might be great for kids and grandkids even. So in between the two hazelnuts is where our turtles are. For those of you who are new, we found a mama turtle laying eight, a box turtle laying eight eggs in the middle of our gravel driveway where people drive all the time. 
So we knew it wasn't a safe place for them, so we moved them right after she laid them to a nice, dirty, soft spot in our uh, garden between the two hazelnuts, and we've, we've been watching them. It is currently day 72. They usually hatch somewhere between 60 and 75 days if they hatch, and I'm hopeful that they'll hatch. We had a dry spell for about three weeks up until last week, and then we started getting some rain, so I'm hoping that the rain will kind of soften up the ground and that they will start digging their way out soon. And when they do, I promise I will film it all for you because that's gonna be really cool. So we'll gather them up and then probably move them farther into the forest where there'll be lots of ground cover and grubs and things they can munch on and hide under. And if you didn't know, um, turtles' sex is determined by the temperature of the ground at the time when they are incubating. So the lower the temperature, the more likely they are to be males. The higher temperature, the more likely they are to be females. Which is actually something I had listened to on a podcast I was going to tell you guys about. I was listening to about turtles and they are noticing that they are now more female turtles being born because temperatures are rising and the nest temperatures are rising and producing more females, which at this point isn't too big of a deal because one male turtle can still fertilize many female turtle eggs, but um, it could be a problem in the future if the temperatures continue to rise unless there's some kind of mutation in the eggs and we see that the males start to hatch at a higher temperature. I don't know, but that's um, just an interesting side fact about turtle hatchings. Okay, so let me tell you about that podcast that I've been listening to. I think because I, my podcast consists of many random ramblings, and a lot of you like that when I'm talking about different facts here and there and things that I learned. So those of you that do like that are going to love this podcast. It's called Ologies, um, as in genealogy, um, nephrology, the ologies. And basically, she talks to people who are experts in certain ologies. Her name's Allie Ward, and she's been doing, well, now she has, a little, I think, 101 episodes. And it's so much fun to listen to. It's one of those things that just takes you down a rabbit hole of some thing that you didn't know anything about, or maybe you did, and you get to learn more, and um, quenches that thirst for more knowledge about things. So I've learned about turtles and tortoises. I've learned about nomology, which is the study of the constitution. It's not necessarily a science, but often it is. I've learned about the study of hair. I've learned about um, the study of um, graphology, handwriting and forgery, disinfectology, which was a bleach expert, um, astrobiology. We talked to someone who uh, about aliens and his study of the planet, someone who studied the moon. Really, really cool. I'm, I've been binging it for the last couple of weeks while I've been working on the shawl, so I would highly recommend it if you're interested in that kind of thing. I think you will enjoy it. There is some cussing. Um, occasionally I've seen that she puts in um, episodes that are edited to take the cussing out, but I haven't noticed that all the time. If you don't like cussing or you're listening with your kids and you want to listen to it first, uh, there is some potty language. <laughs> Other things that I want to tell you about, I have been doing a little bit of dyeing. I had a lovely friend, Nicole, who is Lime Green Ruse, come over to visit. She, um, Lime Green Ruse on Instagram. She and I met through Instagram because she noticed my last name and asked me if I knew a certain person with the same last name. Turns out he's my cousin and it was her gym teacher when she was in high school. <laughs> So we had this instant connection. She now lives in Spain. So anyway, she was coming over from Spain. She was taking a trip to Asheville. We got to meet and hang out, which was wonderful. And she brought me these. At the time, they were white. This is Tintica yarn, which is a Spanish merino, a beautiful yarn. And the woman who owns Tintica does natural dyeing. But she sent me white yarn because she knows that I like to dye my own. So I immediately put one in indigo and the other one in goldenrod. And then I switched because I wanted to see how they would differ if I put the yellow last or the blue last. And in a very, very faint way, you can tell that this one is the slightest bit more blue and this one has the slightest bit more yellow. But honestly, 
if you didn't know to look for that, you wouldn't be able to tell. But it's something good to know because if if you're wanting a shade, a, a shade more yellow or a shade more blue or whatever when you're dying, then you would know how to how to dip them. The indigo seems to put a little bit more of a blue tint to it. So let me see if I can show you this. So the one on the left had indigo second and the one on the right had goldenrod second. Can you see just the slightest difference? They look much more teal, I feel like, on the camera. They're more of an emerald green in person, but the color has turned out beautifully. Yeah, you can see it a little bit more there. It's more of a green on the right. So that was a fun experiment. Uh, one of my viewers passed along a video that I'm going to put in the show notes that was a really cool, quick video about indigo and the traditional indigo dyers. And I think it said there were only five, five dyers doing it the same way he does it now. But it's a really good video. It's, it's quick to watch, but really interesting if you'd like to see the process of this production indigo dyer. Just a couple other things to chat about. I want to remind you that all of my patterns are 20% off on Ravelry right now and will be through August and all of the proceeds from those sales are going to be going to the American Civil Liberties Union and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So pass the word along, the more pro um, patterns that are sold, the more money I can donate to them. So I really appreciate anything you guys can do to spread the word and any patterns that you purchase. Thank you. Another thing that I wanted to mention is that I am hosting an herb slash tea swap for the holidays. It can be for Advent, it can be leading up to Kwanzaa, to Hanukkah, whatever you want. All of the uh, major winter holidays are falling around the same days. So I thought it would be a lot of fun to do a swap. So I'm making small groups of four or seven. We'll see how many people we get. Okay, for example, if there's a group of seven people, each person in the group will send four teas or herbs to the six other people. So each person will end up with 24 total. So if you start on December 1st, you can open one package a day leading up to Christmas. Uh, if you want to lead up to solstice or Kwanzaa or Hanukkah, whatever you want to do, you can start it on those days. It's international. You don't have to ship international. You just have to let me know where you want to ship. But all the details are in the Ravelry group under Herb Tea Swap, and it's going to be a lot of fun. You could probably put everything you swap in an envelope, so it won't be expensive to send it. Each little daily package is only two teaspoons of whatever herb uh, you send. Unless you're sending a, pa a prepackaged tea, then you just put one in there and you wrap it up and you don't know what you're going to get. So every morning you can open up your, your herbal tea or packaged herbs, whatever it is that, that has been sent to you, and you get to try a little something new each day. And you get to share it with six other people. So join if you can. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hope to have a bunch of groups going. That's in the Ravelry group. And I think it would be a really sweet way to encourage us to sit down and have a moment each day where we enjoy the tea or we maybe, maybe you get two teaspoons of thyme one day, you could use that in your cooking that evening or for lunch or something like that. It just kind of reminds us to slow down a little bit. So yeah, spread the word. I hope that's going to be a lot of fun. It does not have to be homegrown herbs. It can be prepackaged herbs or teas, whatever you are able to share. I think there's only two other things that I wanted to talk about. The first is that the Livestock Conservancy is using my pattern, my fleece flight pattern, to encourage people to experience different rare breed yarns and then share it at Rhinebeck. So instead of a Rhinebeck sweater, they're doing the fleece, fit Rhin fleece flight Rhinebeck shawl, which is so cool. And anyone who knits it and goes to Rhinebeck, um, we're all going to meet for a group photo at the Livestock Conservancy booth so that we can share the yarns and fleeces that we've put into our shawls. So I will have a link to that also in my show notes. And any of you who are already participating in the Fleece Flight Knit Along, which goes through November 15th, if you're going to be at Rhinebeck, you are welcome to come by. That would be a lot of fun to see what you've made. So one thing I got a few months ago, and I have not shared with you yet, but I really love, I put it to the side to share later and had forgotten about it. 
I signed up for a mystery package from Wild in the Woods, whose yarn you know I love. She is a Canadian dyer who does natural dyes, and she did a Practical Magic three-part series this year. For those of you who don't know, it's a movie that came out in the 90s, maybe? Um, a super cute mu movie that is just like the perfect Halloween family movie to watch, but mostly it's about these two sisters who are magical and have to learn how to accept who they are. But she has been making these little um, packages, Serena Wild in the Woods has been making these packages based on themes from the movies. So the second one she sent me has this lovely crown. It has, says Midnight Margaritas, it's a mug with the quote, Eye of Newt, Toe of Frog, Wing of Bat, Tongue of Dog, Adder's Fork, and Blind Worm's Sting. Barbados Lime is just the thing. Fragia's salt like a sailor's stubble. Flip the switch and let the cauldron bubble. And it was something that they said before they were making margaritas one time when they were having a, a little family get together. It's also got a margarita mix, a little straw, some soap called Put the Lime in the Coconut, and two beautiful skeins of yarn. I'm gonna come closer to show you these. So here they are. It's a single ply of her um, sea folk yarn. 100% rustic Canadian wool botanically dyed slowly and naturally using locally harvested plants and salt water from the Pacific Ocean. I love that. So there's a gray, light gray and dark gray, and then kind of the peachy pink and cream. They're so beautiful. I think I want to use all the yarns that I get from her mystery boxes and put them together in something, but I don't know what yet. So that is the last thing. Those are the things that have been going on or coming into my household over the last few weeks. I hope you guys are doing amazingly well. Um, hopefully I will have some knitting and spinning for you next time I see you. Have a great fantastic couple of weeks. Enjoy the beginning to your September and I'll talk to you soon. Bye! Gonna cry when you're gone